Welcome to Friday Hex 219. I hope all of you had a great week so far. And we have two talks today, one by Mr. Lee Hong Yi and another one by Joe Sar. Our sp first speaker will be Ling Hong Yi, who will be sharing about securely digitizing the Singapore government. Hong Yi leads an experimental team of engineers, designers, and product managers who build technology for the public good. Projects they worked on include Parking SG, an app to replace parking coupons, Go Government SG, the official government link shortener used to help fight phishing, and Redeem SG, a digital voucher system used for the latest CDC voucher program. Amidst COVID-19, he has also led the team to rapidly develop systems to support testing, quarantine, and vaccination world nationwide. He believes in working on real problems, reading for the users, and pushing for change. And prior to joining the public sector, Hong Yi worked at Google on the distributed databases and image search teams. He previously attended MIT, where he obtained degrees in economics and computer science. And in his free time, he works on personal projects like typographing.com and shelley.com. Mr. Lee, please. Hi, everybody. Uh, all right, so let's see. Uh, can those of you hear me here? And online, can people hear me? I don't know whether they can say, oh, video's off. But I'm going to assume that you can hear me. I'm just going to move forward. Um, Okay, hello everybody. So my name is Hong, and today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, zero knowledge secret sharing. Um, so basically, this this talk is about how we use end-to-end -end encryption in order to build uh, sort of like digital services in the government, where the where us as the team building the services have basically zero knowledge of the information that's passing through them. Um, and the advantage of this is like you know you get a lot of privacy guarantees, you get a lot of security advantages because the less information we have. Um, like, like counter to sort of like the, con the, the, the general belief that like the government wants your information. Actually, most government officers do not want to touch your information because once you touch information, there's like all these like security requirements and like audit requirements, all this stuff that you have to do. So most people just like would rather not deal with any of this. And the more we can do so, the easier it is to roll out digital services. Um, this has got nothing to do with like zero knowledge proofs. So any of you who have like read about like, you know, DK snark zero knowledge proof stuff that people do on the blockchain or whatever, uh, this is not related to that. So this is basically the problem we're trying to solve, um, that sharing data in the government is pretty hard. Um, there's a lot of things that you need to do. Uh, where th these are sort of like the basic steps that you need to go through whenever someone wants to share data. Um, first, you need to ask about what data there is, because the government doesn't have like this nice big sort of like re repository and list of all the data sets that gov government officers have. Basically, you need to go like email somebody and then ask them, hey, do you have something like this? And they'll get back to you. Then you have to tell them like what you're trying, like where you're coming from, and what you know why you're asking for it. Because government officers are generally speaking quite sh uh, quite cagey about sharing data, even with other government officers. Um, then they'll like give you show you what they have. They'll show you like a sample, and they're like, no, no, that's not quite right. And you ding dong back and forth. After you do all that, you need to get approved from your from your your boss to request the data. They need to get approved from their boss to share the data. Then you need to file an official data request form, which gets approved. And then afterwards, you need to go through vendors because you don't have direct access to the database. You need to go like you know. Um, like, uh, get a quote from Accenture or, or NCS, whoever's running the database. Um, then you go put up a paper in order to get funding for it. Then you need to like literally take a hard drive, get in a cab, head over to the government agency, and then like download the data onto a hard drive and cab back to your office in order to, in order to use the data. Um, as you can imagine, this is, this is a huge pain. And this is not just like theoretical. We actually like mapped out, uh, is it updating? No? Okay, yes, yeah, here we go. Uh, we actually mapped out the user journey, uh, we actually interviewed a bunch of data scientists in the government and we mapped out the user journey of like what it is they're trying to do, uh, what it is they have to do when they go through, uh, so going through a data analytics project. So you can see here, you start out and you're like pretty happy, right? You're like this uh, sort of young optimistic guy, uh, young optimist officer, you came out of school, you know, you have a degree in like artificial intelligence and like data analytics or whatever. And you think, I know how to use all this data and there's all these opportunities that I can use to sort of streamline and optimize the government and like make everything really nice and efficient. And then you start working and then you get really sad. And you can see basically what you encounter really, really quickly is you realize that like even, I mean, I know it's really hard to read, but basically just even finding out what data government agencies have is like extremely difficult. There's a lot of them there. Um, and you go back and forth and you go back and forth to the request, like I said, and after you get a couple months of approval, you take a few months to sort of like transfer the data back and forth because you have to do it over hard drives. And then actually after like almost the entire year, you have like two weeks to two months of actual analytics on the project. And this is like, uh, so we used to be from the data science division. These are, this is the actual lived experience for a lot of our data science colleagues in the government. So what do you do, right? Basically, if, you are, if you're wondering like why the government isn't more technically advanced or why we don't use AI to solve this problem or that problem or this or whatever, this is why. It takes 12 months to go through this whole cycle. 
which is why it's like, you know, which is, and so you can imagine whatever potential there is aside, if there's this much friction in order to do a project, you, you can't even get started. And so, which is why, and so what's the solution? Well, the solution is build a platform, right? Uh, as you know, that, that's sort of the common solution nowadays. We will build a platform to share data. This is the sort of VC pitch. And every government agency will upload all their data to this platform. And then everybody in the government who needs and can use data can then search it, can search all the data sets, they can preview what data is there, and they can download it straight into their machines without having to like, you know, go back and forth with hard drives. Um, and this sounds really great and really awesome, except that you have one big problem, which is that now you have one set of servers, one system that has all of the government's data sets, essentially. Like all of the government's data is now stored in one big system, which means that that system like gets compromised everything like everything from like medical records to like you know like marital status to like where your children go to school to like health rec uh, to, to, to like you know education records all that stuff all leaks out which is no good um and so you know, what do you do right you, you you don't want to go back to this because like this literally this literally is like security through bureaucracy basically you have all this like information and it's spread across different servers and it's so hard to get that it's really hard to hack because even if you actually want to use it you can't actually get it um uh, so so you can't go back to this because then you're just you know, non-functional. You're, you're, you're basically as secure as a brick. Um, so what do you do? Well, um, what we're going to do is we're going to build, we basically built a really simple sort of zero knowledge system. And this is not really complicated. If any of you guys know how WhatsApp works, basically you have like encryption keys. And so uh, when someone uploads the data, to, we build a platform where someone uploads the data to a platform, um, it gets encrypted. The encryption key is like left with the person who uploaded it. And you know, and it's handed out, uh, this, this decryption key is handled uh, out of band. Out of band is a very fancy way of saying, basically not my problem. So when someone uploads the file, we give them the key, you say you sort it out, deal with it, you know, however you handle keys or like passwords or whatever. And then when someone wants to like access the data, they have to request, they can do, they can do the search and everything. They can find like the name of the data set and the kind of like description of it. But when they actually want to access the data, they have to go get the decryption key from the, from the, uh, from the owner of it. And then they decrypt the file. So this is great. This is an improvement over what we had before where you have like, because now if you have like, if the server gets compromised, you don't leak out all the data, but there's a new problem, which is that you have a key essentially, which is a new single point of failure because, you know, obviously uh, what this means is that, you know, if you compromise the server and you actually get someone's key because, you know, you're given a post-it note or their personal laptop or whatever, you can, come, you can still, uh, it's still a compromise. But there's a bigger, far bigger problem, which is that people lose keys. It's, it's a thing that you figure out very, very quickly in government that like one of the biggest things that the IT support department has to deal with is just resetting people's passwords because people lose keys. It's a thing that they do. And if you were to use a system like this, just like this in order to, in order to store people's data, then what will end up happening is that people will lose, key, lose a key at some point and then suddenly the whole country's like medical records are now just gone and unrecoverable, which would be extremely bad. Um, so the solution we have to this is to split the key. So you can basically, what you're doing here is you take a single key, you split it across like five different, uh, five different parts or even more than that, where some subset of them, so any, you split into five different parts, any three parts of them can regenerate the original key. Um, it's a pretty, and so there, this is a few and big advantages, right? One, no individual person can go rogue and compromise your data. Like you can't have one person just be like, wake up one day and it's like, I'm going to like get all the government data and share it. And I can't cut because you need the collaboration from at least two other people in order to do it. And has the other big advantage, which is, if you happen to lose the key or someone like misplaces it or something like that, then, uh, then you know, it's not, not a big deal because as long as you have the other four keys remaining, or at least any three of them remaining, you can still regenerate the original key. Um, and this sounds like some really complicated math magic, but it's actually really elegant. Um, it's basically based on sort of, you know, like it's basically based on polynomials. It's based on, on simultaneous equations, the stuff you learn in secondary school, right? Basically any two points define a line, any three points define a curve, and any four points define a cubic curve. And so if you want a key, if you want a key where any three points can regenerate it, then what you do is you simply like draw an arbitrary like curve. Um, you draw an arbitrary quadratic curve, and then you take five points along that quadratic curve. And once you've found those five points on the quadratic curve, you can just take the three points and then solve for, you know, solve for the formula of the curve and find where it interse intersects uh, the y-axis. And you treat the y-axis intersect or the x-axis intersect or some other property of the curve as your actual secret key. Um, and this means, and you can see from this very simple math, how you, can, how you can generate keys of, you can generate an arbitrary number of keys because curves can have arbitrary numbers of points and any arbitrary number of them required to regenerate uh, the original key. 
um, which is really useful because this solves a general problem of like no key management that, that often is a, this like, complicated, very like difficult thing of I lock, I hand it over to you, who has access, whatever, and you just split it this way. Um, the paper for this is actually pretty interesting. It's, a, it's like a one page paper or something like that. So if you want to read it, it's, it's a really sort of elegant proof that, that proves to be like quite useful in a lot of situations. So we've solved the problem for, uh, we've solved the problem for like one-to-one -one sharing. Like I'm a government officer, I have a data set and I want to share it with, uh, and I want to share it with, uh, you know, some other government officer. So, you know, I, I encrypt it, I take the key, I split it on hand over to whatever, and then we take the com combined key and hand it to the person who needs it. Um, but what if you need to get information from the public? What if you have a many-to-one relationship, right? Like I need to send out a form for people to sign up for their vaccination appointment, for example. There is no way I'm going to have like everybody like upload data and then the other keys from everybody and then like slowly download one or another decrypted. It's kind of insane, right? Um, so what, what do we need to do? So you need, a different, you need a different solution for this. And this is the approach that we use, which is asymmetric key encryption. Basically, it's just public key cryptography. Um, I'm assuming you guys have like some passing familiarity with like public private keys and things like that. Basically, uh, for those of you who don't, uh, one key encrypts things, the other key decrypts things. That's, that's more or less what you need to know. And the encryption key can't decrypt things and the decryption key can't encrypt things. So um, what happens with this is that when someone, you create a digital form, right? you create a web form for, um, you know, for, the for, for the public. And this looks just like a normal form. But when you create the form, we generate a pair of keys, a public and a private key. Basically, the, the encryption key is stored together with the form. And whenever someone loads the form uh, in, a like in a browser, the encryption key is you know, in the JavaScript and it's loaded there and you know, it's ready to encrypt the form response once a person clicks submit. So when someone clicks submit, um, the, the encryption key stored with the form uh, encrypts the, encrypts the uh, response before sending it to the server. So the server never ever sees unencrypted responses. It only ever sees encrypted responses. At the same time, the creator of the form gets the decryption key and he stores it again out of band. I mean, you can split the key and you can do all kinds of funny things to manage it, but basically you store it out of band. And after all the form responses have come in, the person who created the, the person who created the form can just download all the encrypted data and then use the decryption key to unlock it. Does that, does that make sense? Um, in reality, what you actually do is because, uh, because asymmetric key encryption is actually quite a bit slower than symmetric key encryption, you use the asymmetric key encryption to encrypt the symmetric key and then you know, blah, 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 and things like that. But like, this, is the, this is the pertinent bit uh, performance, performance uh, side. So we've handled like sort of many to one, but now you have actually a, a sort of an, 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 another interesting use case, which is that you often want citizens to be able to share information with each other in a verified manner, verified by the government, right? So I need to, for example, if I am going into a bar, I need to prove that my birthday is about like, you know, I'm above 21 or something, uh, right? Or if I am going to like, you know, rent a car, I need to prove I have a driver, I have a valid driver's license. It's a fairly common thing. And so this is this big bag of words of private verified identity sharing is basically describing that. How can I share my information with someone else in a way that they can verify that I'm saying what I'm, I, that I, firstly, I'm a real person. And secondly, that the information I'm sharing is correct. And I do so in such a way that I don't create like big privacy compromises all over the place. So what we have right now is sort of the NRIC. And this, and I, you know, for those, I guess you, you, you guys all know, like a few years ago, uh, there was a sort of like this big scale of NRICs and you sort of like ban them from being used everywhere. And whenever you check into any place, you need to say like last three digits for his birthday or some nonsense like that. Um, because the problem with NRICs fundamentally is that if you have one common identifier that you use everywhere, every place that uses it potentially is a source of compromise. Because let's say you have a hospital, a restaurant, and a bank, and the you know, hospital, you obviously use NRIC, your bank, you obviously use NRIC. But when you go, for example, you sign up for like, you know, I go your KFC rewards card or something like that, right? You also use your NRIC. And the problem with that is that maybe the hospital and bank, you know, they don't, hospitals and banks may, may have problems with cybersecurity, but if you imagine every single restaurant you've ever been to with a rewards or loyalty program, one of them at some point is going to have a data, is going to have a data, data compromise. And because one of them at some point has a data compromise, Let's say the restaurant, right? Let's say KFC is not the world's expert in cybersecurity and they have a data leak, then suddenly all your records of when you went to, went to a KFC are now public, which is a problem because anybody who works at the bank or anybody who works at a hospital, anybody who works at any one of the other places which you shared your ID with can look at the KFC, can look at the, the leaked records, find your ID, find what your actual name is because I can look at my, uh, look at my own records and then ta-da, you like, you've, you, I know, I know, I like, you know, this in this case is just when you've eaten chicken, but like I know what neighborhood you live in, roughly speaking. You know how frequently you go there. I know who you go with. You know things like that. Um, so that's like, that's basically 
the more like there is a problem with a common identifier because you know basically you created this common common failure mode. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to have private verified identity sharing. Basically, the the problem you're trying to get to is there are, you want to identify strongly identify that the government is a. Let me just grab this. Um, you want to strongly identify that the government can assure that person that this is a real person, that you have a separate identifier per person. So this is the, this is the solution we're trying to get to. We want to create a situation where you have a separate identifier per person, per business, but it is a consistent identifier. So hopefully this makes sense. Basically, if I go to, if I go to KFC, I will, have, I, I will share a certain identifier. And every time I go back there, KFC knows that this is the same person so that they don't have, you know, they can give promo deals, they can like give first time customer rewards or something like that. And very importantly, if they find like, let's say I've been very rowdy in the restaurant, they can kick me out and ban me from a KFC ever again, right? Um, but that identifier is different from the one I use for the hospital and different from the one I use to the bank. And this is really important because there are very few sort of entities in the world which can strongly verify a human being and governments are pretty much the main ones. Like other than governments, it's very rare that you find a sort of entity which has official records of human beings, right? Um, and so you need a way for the government to provide this while maintaining privacy such that you don't have one place where like, you know where everybody goes and like all that kind of thing. So how do we, how do we achieve this? Basically, this happens in a few steps. Um, the first step is a user authenticates himself. So the user strongly authenticates himself in some way. This can be using like your existing sign-in flow. This can be about like showing up in person or like, you know, like doing a FaceTime call, whatever you, whatever classifies a, strong, a strongly authenticated to verify this is a human being. Once you strongly verify this is the actual person, um, you give him access and he connects to a server which downloads all his personal information, like uh, personal information from the government to his device. So this is like, you know, your birth cert, your educational cert, your medical records, your whatever, whatever information you need. And all this information is digitally signed uh, with the government sort of like, you know, uh, uh, public, uh, public key. Um, so give all the information and device. But also we generate an anonymous ID. So we don't use NRICs here first. We generate per person an anonymous ID that's stored once on your phone and also handed over to the transaction server, which is a separate server from the, uh, from the onboarding server. Then in the next step, when once you've set up this, whenever you want to share information with someone, so I know there's a lot of stuff going on here, so I'll, I'll try to walk you through it. Um, let's say a business you see in the bottom right, the business sends an information request link to the person. This can be a QR code. This can be like, you know, through a message. This can be like through an app me mechanism, whatever it is, the, the, the person who you want to share information to sends a request link, sends a request sort of like the app on your phone. What it does is that if you, you can see what information the guy's requesting, you say, okay, or not okay, or whatever, and you, and you, and you say, okay. You, the, the, the app will encrypt the information stored on your phone into uh, using, the, using the public key of the business. So take note, like it encrypts it such that the business, but not the government or the government servers can see what information is inside. This information, this encrypted packet, then gets handed up into the transaction server. Once it's handed into the transaction server, what happens is we take the anonymous ID because we have the transaction server take note, doesn't see your NRIC, only sees this anonymous ID. And so whoever's running a transaction server has no visibility into this. It takes this anonymous ID. It takes the business's business ID and it hashes them together to form a unique ID per person. That is, that is attached to the, the encrypted packet along with a sort of, you know, verifi along with a signature verification sort of um, key so that they, uh, so that the business can verify the information inside the packet. And this is sent down to the business. The business then takes his, you know, decrypts the packet, looks inside, he takes the, the, the he can see the, the, the business specific ID that has been handed to him and he can decrypt and he can use the, and he can, and he can use the, uh, he can use the public key handed to him to verify the signatures inside the pack, encrypted packet to verify that this is indeed actual legitimate government information. The person's not like faking and putting some nonsense inside there. Um, this is the basic. This is the basic flow of it. There's a, some like, some nuances in here that I'm skipping over, but that's the basic idea. You sign up, you get all your information, and you get generated an anonymous ID, which is handed one to you and one to the transaction server. So this way, the sign up server knows that you've signed up, but I don't know what you're doing with it. I just know that you've downloaded your information, like every other citizen would have. And the transaction server doesn't know who you are. It just knows that some person who the who the sign up server has given an ID to, 
is sort of like, you know, is, is, is sending information to some business. The person encrypts the data that the business, so that only the business can see it. This is basically a, almost, almost like sending a WhatsApp message over to the business and encrypted in such a way that only business can see it. And the business can, but the business can verify the information inside is indeed legitimate. This is a few cool, uh, interesting properties. Um, first one is that, like I said earlier, if the restaurant, if the, if the restaurant has an information compromise, then all they see, all that is compromised is that business ID 39 NFK S88 or whatever went to this restaurant. This is a different ID from your hospital ID, a different ID from your bank. All of this is, and this means that actually if, uh, if like KFC leaks your records, who cares, right? You don't have to share your name anymore. Like there's no reason to share your name or your address or any of this other stuff. I mean, you can if you want to, but actually if the business just needs a sort of strong verification for an individual person, you don't have to do that anymore. You just get the, you just get this sort of like a business specific ID and, and any data leaks are now basically irrelevant because you just see a bunch of random IDs doing a bunch of random things, but the business has their benefit of like tracking when and where these sort of interactions take place. Um, the other big advantage is that this basically lets you clamp down a lot on uh, sort of like cyber, uh, like on a lot of web online problems. So as you guys know, there's a lot of like a lot more scams going on nowadays, right? So you have like, you know, you, you have obviously like, you know, carousel scams or whatever, where people like sell you some nonsense. And the problem is that when you ban the person from the platform, you know, he just creates another account. And similarly on like dating apps, there are a lot of like love scams nowadays, you know, people, they'll pretend to be whatever and then ask them to send money. And even when this is detected and after all that you ban the person or they just create a new profile and they just log back onto the platform. Um, we have something like this. You can say, you can make it such that only people, you have to verify that you are an actual person with an actual ID. And if someone sort of like misbehaves on the platform in some way, you can, you can take action against them or you can block them from the platform and they can't just come back with a, with a new different identity. And this is really important because you get this, you get this ability to take action and block, that, and, and, block, and block that activity while without having to compromise, without the government having to know that you are transacting on a dating app, for example, which presumably none of you want. Um, this is, this is an extremely interesting property. So yeah, um, where we are, so I've talked about some about the theory of this. I can share sort of like actual implementations of what we're doing here. So this here is a screenshot of Vault. It is, our, it is, it is something we're rolling out. Um, it's, we're still in the business of getting uh, agencies on board and getting them to upload their data, but basically it's a data sharing platform where you can search and find data and you click download and it seems all fine, except when you upload, you get a key and when you download, you have to, you have to put in the key that you get through other means. You have FormSG. Uh, FormSG is, I'm sure, like, I mean, you guys probably have si signed up for your, uh, pre-registered for your vaccinations, and that was like a digital form that was built with FormSG. In fact, most digital forms that you've seen on, online nowadays where, like, I don't have an example here, but, you know, you have this nice big colored bar at the top and then this big font and everything, that's probably a FormSG form. We've got about 60 to 70,000 forms in the Singapore government right now. Um, and finally, we got SGID. Um, so SGID is basically an experimental sort of extension to SingPass that we're, that we're working around with. The idea is that it's integrated into the SingPass app um, and it is more or less transparent to the, to, uh, to the users. So as a user, uh, for, for certain websites you sign into, rather than using the traditional SingPass authentication which shares your NRC and everything, um, there, are certain, there, are certain, uh, web, there are certain services that we are testing using SGID out, SGID out on, which to the user is more or less the same. You might get a prompt to say, do you want to share this information or not? Other than that, completely transparent and you just sign in and at the back end, you're not actually sharing your actual NRC, you're just sharing uh, sort of like this, this, um, this business specific ID. Um, so yeah, I, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I have a lot more products that we can talk about and I can share and things about the team and things like that. Uh, but I've been talking for quite a bit. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's who we are. We're the open government products team. And yeah, uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to talk about it. Cool. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I've talked, yeah, yeah. do you guys have any questions? Anything you want to like elaborate on? Anything that you know, would be interesting? Um, I mean, this is a very open-ended question because it's like literally the entire field of cybersecurity. Um, the whole point of zero knowledge uh, sort of systems is that it matters less if the servers are secure. So like even if you compromise, I mean, obviously you don't want them to be compromised, but even if it's compromised, it doesn't matter. Um, but that being said, there's a few things that you obviously you do. Um, I mean, the first thing is that, I think the first and most obvious way is that you try not to have servers at all. You try to use serverless frameworks as far as you can. I don't know if you guys are familiar with serverless frameworks. 
probably have used them at some point, right? Like use lambdas or you use like, you know, I don't know, cloud, I think I clinked out Cloudflare, some like Cloudflare workers or stuff like that, where you just like literally write the code, your business logic, and you just like shove it onto the serverless systems. And then like they run it at a particular IP address. And so this way you don't, you just, this at least cuts out the whole sort of like infrastructure layer of like security management. Um, Cause you don't like, you know, the traditional way of doing this is that you literally have like a physical machine there that you have to like lock in a cage and then you have to like secure the network and put in a firewall and put this in the subnet and blah, 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 blah. But you just like throw it onto like a serverless, infra uh, onto a serverless framework and they handle all of that for you. And all you need to make sure is that you need to make sure that one, you manage your own security key that you don't, like you two-factor authenticate the account so that other people can access the account. And two, um, you make sure that at the application level, your application doesn't have like weird security holes. Um, the short answer to how you secure these things is you need to red, you need to red team, you just need to pen test like a lot. Whatever you do, you need to test outcomes because no amount of sort of like procedural approaches will, will ever secure a platform if you don't test it, yeah. Um, Hi, do, uh, so Nigel asks, hi, do we need any background in cybersecurity to join the OGP? Um, not specifically, no. I mean, I don't have a background in cybersecurity specifically. I mean, I took like one class in school um, and most people who join, I don't think of anyone who joined who had like a very, who had like a very deliberate cybersecurity background. Though if you do, I would absolutely appreciate it because we probably don't know what the hell we're doing and like having someone who does would probably be a lot better. Um, but yeah, uh, you, it, it, that's all. Um, all right, so there's another question here from SY. Would businesses have to be registered before they're able to use SGID? Um, so in theory, yes. Uh, in practice, what we're trying to do is we try to set up like, we try to do the setup for them. Uh, and so we basically built a sort of like you know, developer, uh, sort of developer kit, uh, so that it, like the, the integration and the verification is already done. And so, you know, you, you just plug into the app. Um, we're, we're following, not exactly, we're basic, but we're more following more or less the OAuth protocol. If you're familiar with what OAuth is, if you like sign in with Google, sign in with Apple, it follows OpenID Connect-ish, or OAuth-like-ish. And then uh, the only thing is that we have an additional step after that, you have to decrypt the data. Um, but otherwise, yeah, if you have integrations with existing login systems, you should be able to just drop it in. Um, it's currently not like open to the public. We're still testing it internally with uh, like some, some, uh, some systems, but yes, in theory, uh, that's how you would use it. Uh, yeah, so if all of your data is currently encrypted at client side before hitting your server, how do you do like indexing? Because I'm assuming it's a lot of data that you're storing. So in order to query it while it's encrypted, how do you do that? Um, so are you talking about are you talking about the data sharing or are you talking about the form? Uh, data share. Yeah, Actually so, both, yeah. Okay, well, so for data sharing, we base the short answer is that we don't index. Like that's not the job of the platform. Like there's a lot of things that you can do. And there are other systems if you want to sort of like have nice secure systems that you want to run all the like complicated analytics over, you do that. This system is very much just like as an exchange to hand it back and forth. One of the things that we do, however, is that what we, do, uh, I, I didn't show you this earlier, but um, let me see if I can find this. If you look at uh, here, right? So this is Vault. You see there's a sample data preview. Um, this is not actual data. What we do is we like take a look at, like we, I mean, we share the actual columns and we share, uh, and then we see what's in the columns. And then we like generate like rubbish data to just fill all of it. So like we, we mix and match, we share, we scramble a little bit, we come up with random like name, dates, whatever. The idea here is just to give a sample to the, uh, to the end person, uh, to, the, uh, to the, the data request of like what they're actually getting into. Um, and that way you get the advantage of like seeing the kinds of data you can get without actually having to like, you know, look into the actual data set. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, for forms, what we do for indexing is, um, for forms, what we do for indexing is that we don't index it ourselves. We hand it, you decrypt, well, we don't index it on the server, it's done client side. And so when you go into, when you sign into the form SG as a government officer and you like want to get your form responses, you type, you, you enter in your, your decryption key, and then enter, turns for, a, I mean, turns for a little bit, like, I mean, don't, it takes like a minute uh, and decrypts all your data. But once it's decrypted, then it's just client side operations. Like, because even with like a million submissions, you can fit it in RAM like, more or less, and mm -hmm. you don't you just cage a little bit. And then you do all, you can run all your rendering and analytics client side. Um, we have other services where we, FormSG has webhooks. So what you can do there is if you want to do deeper analytics or you want to do like more indexing, what you can do is you can just webhook the information out. And so that way, 
the, the form platform doesn't have access to everything, but if you want to like send it to whatever other services you have, you just like pump it through and then you can do, uh, you can do stuff there. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Cool. Um, I have a question here. Daryl asks, are OGB's data solutions beholden to government's data privacy policy? Um, so yes, um, which is why, so, so this is exactly why we designed them in this way. Um, so I, I did give you guys a little bit of background. Um, one, of the, one of the things, uh, if any of you drive, uh, you know, if you use Parking SG, you notice that Parking SG has like no, uh, no username and password, right? There's no login, no signing system, you just like literally start using the app. And like, this obviously is a big win for consumers because you don't have to manage username and password. But it's actually, a, the big reason we did that is because I didn't want to have to deal with usernames and passwords. Because once you have to deal with usernames and passwords, then you have to like store the passwords, then you have to make sure that you hash them and sort them correctly, then you have to verify it there, and then now it's associable with a person. All I see, I don't even store payment information. Payment information is just dealt with our, dealt with, with our payment provider, and it just sends us the sort of payment tokens that we use to sort of like collect the money. Because of this, I am able to sort of like host it in like basically with much less scrutiny. Because all the information that's on platform is at this car park here at this time, which you can see just by walking on the street. I don't have username and passwords, I don't have payment information, and so you bypass a lot of that. So uh, yeah, so, so the, 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 that's the sort of long answer, but basically we are absolutely beholden to the government data policy, which is why I spent so much time trying to like figure all this nonsense out because this is way like, like if you're building like a normal startup, I wouldn't recommend doing any of this because it's unnecessary. Uh, but if you're beholden to government data policy and you can either do this or you can spend like you know, half a year dealing with data and privacy requests, you, you do this instead. Lah. Any other questions? All right. If no other questions, I guess yeah. Thanks so much for thanks so much for 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 listening in and uh, listening to me talk. Thank you guys. Our second speaker will be Joe Sar from Guardian, and he and his talk it's two weeks too slow. Joe has been passionate about making travel more efficient for 15 years. His background includes being an early employee at Skyscanner, going on to lead airline integrations, APIs, and white labels for them, including powering um, flight search for Bing and MSN. He believes strongly that a hardworking, passionate team who are focused on solving problems for customers can change an industry. Please welcome him. Hi, everybody. Um... Thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking to you today. Um, I, I was invited to talk a bit about our experiences of, of running a software company. Um, and I've chosen to really focus on how we organize our time. Um, not because it's a, a minor detail of what we do, because, but because it's really been critical to our success so far as, as a startup. Um, in keeping with a talk about using time effectively. I may not use the whole hour in order to, to cover this and um, I'll leave a lot of space for questions at the end. So just a bit of background, um, who we are, uh, we're a, a travel API company. We were founded in 2017 um, and we power booking websites like Priceline, Kiwi.com, Hopper, Trip.com and Specifically, we power their ability to sell paid seats and checked baggage, as well as um, powering flights on some of, some of our customers. Um, we were in the Y Combinator winter 2019 batch, and we've been growing extremely rapidly. So some of our customers who we've, we've picked up over the years are some of the biggest names in travel. And all of that started with just me and, and Stephen in his living room in uh, in California. And really the reason that we've been able to have that success and have the customers that we've got and, and grow the revenue that we've, we've grown is, is due to the way that we plan our work. So I'm, I'm gonna um, really address this talk to, to all of you, um, especially those of you who are interested in going and starting your own business, but really anybody who is going to be operating on a team building software on a team, um, it's always good to think critically about how you organize your time, how your team organizes your time, because really time is, is your most valuable asset. And you will, um, there will always be ways that you can use it more effectively. And the, the common received wisdom about how to do Scrum or Kanban style planning are really just 
very basic building blocks that you can you can completely throw out and start again. So that's overall the, the message of what I want to share. Um, this is just an example of the kind of products that we launch, just so you, you have a picture of what we do. If you're booking on, uh, say, Priceline.com, once you've picked your flight, they'll show you this seat map. And, and this is actually a React widget that we power on their site. So how's it going? I mean, likely we don't we don't do a lot of publicity so you likely haven't heard of us but um in terms of how startups can can do there's a lot of variety in those that succeed and those that that fail and for us we are doing extremely well so between 2019 when we were in y combinator to 2022 we've grown revenue from 200k a year to 13 million a year but we've only grown our team from two people to 20 people so that's 65x revenue growth and only 10x team growth. So we've grown revenue six and a half times faster than the team. Um, and really that is due to the way that we use our time efficiently. We, we make absolutely the most that we can out of every hour of the day from the team members who work with us. So really what we have a process that we call the plan. And this this is the secret to our efficiency and, and this is what i want to share with you today um we don't spend a lot of time on naming so we, we just call it the plan um but that's uh it, it's our planning session that we do twice a week and really it's this more than any specific technology or content or relationship that's allowed us to out compete our competition so Really, you know, I, I, I don't want to do another talk where I'm sure you've heard lots about how to organize scrum meetings and how to organize Kanban. Um, this, is, this is different from that in that we have come up with something that is completely unique to us. And I want to encourage you to come up with things that are ways of using your time that are completely unique to you. If you're working on side projects or trying to spin up startup ideas of your own, it's really critical that you start from your own values and what you want to achieve with your startup. And then from there, work out how you're going to organize your time. Because if you follow the, the common pra practices of other larger tech companies, really you're, you're doing what works for Google or what that works for Facebook, but that's unlikely to be what works for you. So I'll jump into what it actually is. Um, it replaces what would traditionally be called a, sp a sprint planning. We do it twice per week, once on a Monday and once on a Thursday. And for us, the frequency is really important. Um, it's only 45 minutes. We work towards monthly goals. So each month we pick the most important priorities that we're focused on as a team, maybe two or three, because we really like to to focus on those as much as possible. Um, each of those goals is led by one of the engineers on our team. And all of the planning is centered around those goals. The planning process is pre-written. So we don't, um, we don't spend as much time talking as in a traditional sprint planning. People write and discuss um, in smaller groups before the plan. Uh, so that actually the planning meeting, the plan meeting itself is extremely efficient and it's engineer driven. So rather than a product manager walking through every part of the process and, and being essentially the single threaded process um, in a sprint planning, it's engineers will actually come up with what they need to work on next. And, and we'll talk about what they worked on last plan. Um, and we also divide the work that we pick up in terms of each person in the team will will pick one thing that they must do and a few things that they should do so it's super clear to everybody in the team exactly what's what's going to happen next so this image on the right here it's a little bit small i'm, I'm sure this is a notion document this is where we write the plan um, we've iterated through various versions of this slack threads trello boards um, but the key, the key bit that has stayed the same is it's pre-written and it's engineer-led. Um, 
and and that has been extremely powerful for us. So the steps that we go through each Monday and Thursday, um, everybody writes what they've done last plan, what they're going to do next plan. Um, before the meeting starts, people pre-read it and comment. And then the, for the first few minutes of the meeting, for the first 15 minutes of the meeting, it's totally silent. Everybody raises their hands in Zoom. We go through and answer comments, add further comments into the document. Um, and only once everybody's had a chance to do that, do we start discussing. And that really focuses the discussion on what is important rather than getting stuck in, in small details. So why do we do it twice per week? Um, we operate in an environment where we're growing extremely rapidly. We have multiple customers um, who each are huge travel companies. Each customer that we have is so huge that they would not believe they are not our biggest customer. Um, you know, we, we work with Trip.com, um, who also have the brand C-Trip, Priceline.com, Hopper. Um, each of these customers are large enough that they really expect us as a, as a small and growing startup to be treating them as the top priority. And so when we learn something new about what one of these customers wants, we need to be able to react to that very quickly. A traditional two week sprint means if we hear about it on the first Tuesday of the sprint, we might be waiting another week and a half before being able to take any action. So this is, this is a really critical part of how we operate. And that's, I guess it's important to understand why we've made these choices so that when you're designing your own process, you can decide whether that's right for you. If you're building a consumer facing startup, maybe the landscape or the environment that you're operating in might not change as frequently. And maybe two weeks is, is perfectly fine. Um, but for us, it's, it's definitely some, it's, it's something that changes a lot and which we want to move with and which has created a lot of value for us. We also have thrown out the traditional roadmap. So a lot of tech teams will plan out months or quarters in, in advance exactly what they're going to be doing. And we do think ahead, um, but we, we do it in a, what we think of as a telescoping fashion. So we know what we're doing in the next three days. We also have planned around our monthly goals. So we know what our top objectives are this month. And we know what our top objectives are this quarter and we know what the most important thing is that we're trying to achieve this year. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that. So in the next three days, somebody might be trying to get special bag prices for, for one airline. So for example, how much does it cost to take a surfboard on Singapore Airlines? That might be part of the monthly goal of launching special baggage selection on one customer. Um, and, and so that, that customer could be a major online travel agency. And that could be part of the quarterly goal that we want to be launching three new products because we want to show that we can um, launch a, a range of products. And that in turn is, is in line with the yearly goal that we are driving towards this year, which is to become the best place for travel booking websites to sell new products. But what, what's missing from that description intentionally is we don't know what we're going to be doing the first sprint of July. We don't know what our monthly goal is going to be. We haven't, haven't decided what our monthly goal is going to be in May or April. Um, we're focused on the current moment in time because that's what we, that's what we know about. And then as we look forward into the future, we're, we're looking at higher and higher level goals. Um, so we don't, we don't look at the granular level too far in the future. And the reason is because the actual path that we'll take to get to the goal will change as we learn things. And a traditional roadmap leads people into a trap where they commit to each other um, within an organization and to their customers 
um, based on things that they don't know about the future. And then as soon as the environment changes, they then have a cascade of apologies and ex excuses that they need to make to their customer because everything is tightly lined up in a stack going forward in future. And as soon as one thing gets delayed, everything gets delayed. So we organize differently from that. And we have found that that gives us a lot of freedom to respond if we, if we learn that a customer has a new initiative or is open to trying a new product. One of the other things that's unique is that engineers lead the goals. And really, I, I would draw an analogy here to moving from a single threaded process to a multi-threaded process or a single server to a horizontally scaled um, set of servers. We have 20 intelligent, business-minded, entrepreneurial people in the team. Um, a lot of whom are engineers. And I think it's a common mistake to believe that only the managers, the engineering managers or the product managers within an organization can make important business decisions. And so that reduces the speed at which the organization can make decisions. Instead, we trust our engineers to work out how to solve the business, biggest business problems that we have. Um, and that allows us to make decisions a lot more quickly and with greater information because the engineers can talk directly to customers. They know exactly what the systems can do. They can talk directly to the designers and they can correlate all of those things to work out exactly how to solve these business problems. We also find that that's just a much more satisfying environment for engineers to work in rather than being told what to do by a manager who, who is disconnected from the day-to-day -day, uh, operation of the product. Picking the one must and three shoulds, or you know, two or three shoulds, is really critical um, because being absolutely clear, brutally honest about what the one thing is that you will do means that everybody has a absolutely clear idea of what to expect from each other. Um, if somebody is expecting something from me and it's not my must that I'm going to be working on, um, and it's just something that I should do, then they know to plan around that. They know that it may or may not happen. Um, and if they need it to be done, then we can discuss that in the plan. Um, and we can agree that it's it's definitely going to be done and, and that it's the thing I must do. Um, and that allows everybody in the team to move with confidence. They know what they can rely on from each other and they, they know what they can't rely on from each other. Um, it's also really critical for us that when people are writing what they're going to be doing next, it's specific and it's it's concrete we don't say next plan i'm going to make progress on bags we'll say next plan i'm going to deploy surfboard baggage support on singapore airlines and that allows us to be uh very clear with ourselves and hold ourselves accountable uh whether we've achieved what we set out to achieve and again, it allows the others in the team to know what they can rely on and, and to know what to expect. When we, uh, when we do the plan, one of the things that's really different about it is, is that everything's pre-written. Um, a typical scrum planning process may be organized around um, JIRA cards, but often there are components of that that are discussed in granular detail, which can really spend a lot of time. Um, and by having engineers in the team pre-write what they're going to be working on, um, we don't waste time. The engineers have already worked out what they need to do, how they're going to do it, and they're the ones that are going to actually do it. And therefore, we don't need um, to have a 10 minute long conversation discussing exactly what uh, text needs to go on the call to action button. It's, um, 
it's much more efficient to to have it pre-written and and that way um, we can do it in parallel and we're not spending a lot of time discussing it. So then with all that, if, if everything's pre-written, why, why even have a meeting at all? Um, the main reason to continue to, to meet even with the, the pre-written plan is to discuss difficult trade-offs. When everything's put down on paper and we see, okay, we have customer X needs uh, to increase the booking volume by 50% and customer Y needs to launch this new product and they both want to do it in the next week, what are the trade-offs? How, um, how do we handle both of those things? What else needs to drop? Um, and those are the bits that only come to light when all of the information is down. And at that point, somebody might bring new information up as well. That's, this, is, this is where we really spend the, the talking part of the plan. Some, as, we're, as we're engaging in those difficult trade-off discussions, somebody might say, ah, I talked to customer X and actually they don't care as much about, about this particular product because they're deprecating one of their systems. And, and that information can affect how we deal with those trade-offs and, and make sure that we make the correct decision. But what we don't spend time on is updating everybody. The key information has already been written and read before the meeting starts. We don't talk through cards one by one um, because the engineer has already decided what they're going to be working on and they've checked in if needed with the team lead or the engineering lead in order to make sure that, that what they're working on makes sense. Um, if, they, if they had any questions about that, or maybe they're already confident about it and they've, they've decided. So um, we don't need to talk through cards in granular detail in the session. Um, we also don't talk through specific solutions. Uh, typically, actually designing a solution is much better done by one person who can hold the whole problem in their head, come up with a solution, maybe solicit feedback on that from one or two other people, but that's a, a individual discussion that happens outside of the plan. So I'm obviously very passionate about this particular process. And the obvious question is, am I advising you to use this process? Should you use this process for your side projects, for the startups that you want to start, for when you um, work for a company and you're operating in a team there, should you advocate for this process? Um, not necessarily. We came to this process from first principles. We started with something that even looked quite different from this, and then we iterated on it, and we will iterate on it in the future. So if you picked up this process today and started using it in your startup, chances are six months from now, we'll already be doing something different because we're always looking at how to improve this. Um, but what I do advise is that you look from first principles like we did at what your values are, what you're trying to achieve, and that you come up with a process that makes the best possible use of your time. Um, so I'll give you an example. For us, we have some things that are different from other companies. We hire entrepreneurial engineers who we trust to lead feature definition. Uh, we don't hire um, people who just want to write code. Um, and we really maximize responsiveness to customers. Uh, the received wisdom is uh, that product managers should lead feature definition and that that's a distinct skill set and a distinct area of expertise. Um, at the moment, because we have uh, commercial team members who are excellent at defining the strategy and engineers who are excellent at leading uh, feature definition, we, we haven't felt the need in our organization to have a separate division of product managers. Um, we also uh, eschew the re received wisdom that uh, the roadmap should dictate the priorities of what is built. 
that we should have a grand strategy that we are working towards that is independent from our customers. We have high level goals that we want to achieve, but we are very responsive to what our customers are telling us that they, that they want. And so I would advise when you're thinking about the, the kind of process that you might find most useful to ask what is different about you? What's really um, different from the received wisdom? So for us, these are, these are critical values because we're growing extremely fast. We're growing 10X every year. Um, we can only grow that fast because we are responding to what customers need. Um, and we need to grow that fast in order to achieve our ambitions of becoming one of the dominant tech players in this industry. So really our, our values start from our strategy and what we're trying to achieve. So I'd ask you and I'd invite you to consider for a moment, what is it that's different about you? What do you value that other people don't value? And how might that translate to how you organize your time? Because time is, is your scarcest resource. It's the thing that will you will never get back an hour that has passed. And so really it is the root of every other resource decision that you make, every other um, strategic decision that you make is how are you going to spend the next hour, the next day, the next month. So in summary, we set goals at a bi-weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annual interval. We hire a team that we trust to lead those goals and find out a way to meet them. We use written communication in order to parallelize that process. Um, and that allows us to be extremely responsive without losing track of, of our direction and where we're going. And that's allowed us to grow to $13 million of annualized revenue with just 20 employees. And this is just the beginning. So I, I thank you for your time. Um, I invite any questions and I'll, I'll also just leave a a subtle note here that we're hiring and do feel free to email me if you're interested. Um, so I'll hand over for any questions. Uh, hi, Joe, I have a question. So hi. I wanted to ask like how this process would scale because I, I see two things. Firstly, it's very engineer driven. So I wonder how like, let's say people who are a bit disconnected from the day-to-day -day engineering work will work with this. And it seems like it's you're pre meet, meeting pretty frequently. So it seems like as the company scales, the time spent on meetings will likewise go up as well, which some people might not like. Yeah, that, that's a really great question. Um, and, and thank you for that, because that gives me an opportunity to talk about a whole, a whole other aspect of this. Um, so one, one um, I'll talk about two parts. So one is we have non-engineers in the same teams as engineers. Um, and, I emphasize the engineer, the engineer led goals, but there are actually um, commercial led goals as part of those same teams. And by having cross functional teams, um, that really reduces the, the communication overhead. We don't need uh, somebody ferrying messages back and forth between an engineering team and a commercial team. Um, so that's worked very well for us. Um, how it's going to scale, let's say to 100 employees or 1,000 employees, I, at the moment, we're, we're still only at 20 people. So I can only tell you what we hope to do. And you know, if we talk again in a year, maybe, maybe I'll tell you whether it's working. Um, we want to organize a team, and, and we've, begun, we've begun this with the first three teams that we have, where each team is focused either on a product or a customer segment. And that team has total autonomy to solve the needs of that customer segment. Um, any code bases that are shared between teams, people can make contributions and ship things directly into those code bases. And, and so we really uh, have a situation where a team of eight people has total autonomy over what they're doing and doesn't need to coordinate cross team and that team can still maintain this high frequency of, of meetings. Um, the reason I, uh, the, I believe we can 
attempt such a structure is because technology has progressed to the point where um, it's always possible. It's, it's now extremely cheap and easy to spin up infrastructure, um, serverless, uh, serverless um, services and data layers, basically the, the kind of the things that had required whole teams to maintain 10 or 20 years ago um, can be spun up very easily. And the way I think about it is if a startup was going to begin and focus uh, competing with us on one of our customer segments, um, then why, why wouldn't we create a team that is focused entirely on that customer segment? And, and so uh, I guess the, the historical advice, you know, I, I read this in Andy Grove's High Output Management. He talked about one can organize a, an organization around either function or around the product. And at the time that it was written, which was in, I believe, the 80s or early 90s, um, the, the advice was to organize around function because that's so much more efficient. You have, you, otherwise, the cost is just too high. But over time, technology has reduced the cost that I think the advice now can be reversed. Um, actually, the advantage you get from organizing around product, organizing around customer segment is much more responsiveness to the customer segment and the cost of operating software in terms of both the raw cost of servers and the overhead of shipping software is so low um, that it doesn't matter if you duplicate a little bit of it. Um, so uh, that was a kind of a long-winded answer, but I, I hope that gives you a picture. We, we want to create um, hundreds of, of pods of five to 10 people each operating as, as we have uh, when, we, when we were five to 10 people. Great question. Any other questions? Uh, hi, Joe. Thank you for uh, just sharing your entire methodology and process. I think it's really innovative in terms of reducing and really maximizing on uh, responsiveness to the customer. Um, I have a question also regarding uh, how, in a sense, it's very structured around uh, being very engineer driven. So would you say that the hiring has actually been the most important part of the entire process and making it work as well as how have you attracted these kinds of engineers that are able to actually communicate with the customer and come up with uh, basically people that you can trust to make the product decisions. Yeah. Mm. Another really great question. Yes, I would agree that hiring has been absolutely critical to making this work. It couldn't work with a different group of people than we've hired. We have a, lot, a high density in, of ex-entrepreneurs and expiring entrepreneurs in our team. Um, not every engineer wants to think about business decisions and not every engineer wants to look at things from a customer point of view. Um, and the ones who do are, are just extremely excited to join a team team where they can do that. Um, it, is, it is hard to hire for that kind of um, passion and that, that specific kind of skill set. Um, and we are constantly trying to work out new ways of, of finding the people uh, who fit that who fit that profile and generally speaking we'll reach out and and try to be as public and as open about how we operate and who we are so that that people know what they're getting into when when we have a conversation um, and then I'll me or Stephen will, will talk to each candidate and really describe what we're doing how we're doing it um, what makes us different and um, I, I also like to learn a lot about where, cust where, where candidates have found a way to make a big impact to, to their users or where they've found things that they're doing that they're really passionate about. Um, because there are people who, um, I, I think those, those questions really often will bring out in people the, the moments where they've acted entrepreneurially and, um, and then we can ask, I can ask more about that and find out um, if, that matches, if that matches the way we operate. 
Thank you so much. Sorry, I hope uh, you don't mind if I ask one more follow up question. So, um, in terms of maintaining this development velocity, is there any technical, um, I would say, architectural infrastructure that has, uh, I mean, you have mentioned serverless, but on top of that, like in terms of dealing with incidents or dealing with, uh, mm -hmm. I would imagine you have very frequent deployments. So, how, like, are there any tips that you can give in terms of how to streamline things? Yeah, um, number one um, is high test coverage, um, automated test coverage. Um, because if you're gonna, gonna be deploying 10 times a day, uh, as we are, um, or, or more sometimes, um, you cannot afford to manually test on each deployment. Um, you might also manually test to make sure that your automated tests are sufficient, um, but always, always be going back to, okay, this thing slipped through the cracks, so we need an automated test to catch that. Um, we have a lot of alerts um, that will tell us when things go wrong, and we have metrics that we can watch to ensure that things are going right and that um, there were no gaps in the alerts. And um, I think we also have a, a general... Um, a general approach that all of our code is accessible to all of our team and people can create pull requests in other, any code base. There's no, there are no gatekeepers in our organization. So I would say those are the key things. Um, we, we deploy, uh, we actually don't use serverless very much at the moment. We mostly deploy on Heroku, um, which we find removes some of the overhead of uh, administering AWS. Um, and, and we find that really useful as well. All right, thank you so much. Great. Uh, hey, Joe, uh, I had a question. Um, hey. So you mentioned that, or maybe I've gotten this wrong, but every single week, you uh, every employer every assigns one must and a couple of different shoulds until the next meeting, right? Uh, mm -hmm. At different phases of the, de the, of the development life cycle, uh, some of the some of the employees would naturally have more workload and would require more than one must and more than one definitely more than one must like because the other people would depend on their work so in that case does the company prefer to spread the work more evenly amongst the employees such that uh, the other people are also helping them develop those features or work on it or is it really just up to them for that period and later on they can you know catch a break mm. Yeah, I, I think the um, I think there's a, there's a few a few areas there where I, one is um, if an engineer is leading a goal, it doesn't mean that they're the only one that needs to work on it, and so they will plan out the work um, for the month, and they'll they'll set themselves milestones so that they know. Are we on track or are we behind track? And if we're if we're behind track, then they will pull in. They'll raise their hand. They'll um, talk to the team lead. Pull in other people to help so that we can get back on track. Um, and so, I guess the engineer in in doing that will avoid a situation where they need to do more than one must in a in a given plan because. Um, even before the plan meeting happens, they will have pulled in help um, and they would have uh, made a contingency plan around that. The, there are exceptions where there's just two things that, that must happen um, and maybe each of them is quick enough that it can be done in a plan. And, and we're, not, we're not really, really rigid about one must, absolutely one must, but it is, um, we are strict about if somebody is saying, I'm going to you know, take on this huge engineering task and I'm going to um, do this huge uh, design task all in the same plan, and it's, there's definitely no way that they can be done in three, three days, we'll, we'll encourage, we'll uh, push, push on that um, individual to, to, be, to think critically about which one they're actually going to do. Because if people take on more than they can do what happens is priority happens by random 
uh, selection. It's going to be either one or one or the other thing will get done, and, and it's an unpredictable which one. So um, we do we do really push on people to um, be upfront and, and clear about which thing they're not going to be doing. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you so much. The concept actually reminds me of this book I read where, uh, where the author suggested that to remember to live your life more fully, you must remember one highlight from every single day. And the focus on one was to make sure that, you know, you remember one thing at least. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good answer. And thanks for explaining your methodology. It was really good listening to you. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I really like that idea of um, enjoying your life by thinking about one highlight every day. I, I think I think there is a great analogy there um, with, with what we're doing here. Um, I see a, a question in the Zoom from, from Ben. Uh, does the Gordian plan on Notion have special features or components? Um, no, we just have a, uh, we just use the regular Notion features. We have um, a template that we've been using for the last few months, but which I'm sure will change in future, um, where we just break down goals previous plan, next plan, and and that, um, and then we have that duplicated for each uh, date where we have a plan. Um, but it's there's there's no special feature there. It's just uh, one of the team leads set that up for us. Great. Um, uh, apologies if I've missed any questions. Uh, do, do ask any more if, if there are more that come to mind. I'm happy to cover any more questions. Great. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, kind of want to curious in terms of, for example, when you grew from two to 20 people, how have you kind of changed as your role as CTO from managing or you know, just you and your co-founder to 20 people? Because I'm guessing now that you can lead a lot of these kind of sprints. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that has been a really, um, a really interesting journey for me. Um, and I think it's a, um, it's a journey that I, I thought might be easier because I'd previously worked at, um, at Skyscanner. I joined as a, um, as an intern, then as a developer, then I moved into management, product management. And so when I, uh, when Stephen and I started working together on, on this startup, I, I would expected to make that transition quite smoothly. Um, but it's, it's actually, um, I think the biggest challenge that I've faced making the transition from, I and mean, really being a CTO with two people means you're writing code. Um, and then being a CTO with four or five people means you're still, uh, you're still writing code, um, but also you need to ensure that the people in the team have the context they need. They know what's expected of them. You're guiding them and, and telling them how to be more effective. Um, and, and really there's a, uh, a transition point, which I, I don't think I'm alone in having found difficult. I think many fi people find it difficult where you're doing a bit of both. And then it becomes very tempting when customer X has a big problem or the product is failing or you're dealing with a particular fire um, to really focus on just the, uh, the engineering problem ahead of you. It feels too risky to tell somebody else about it and, and to, fully trust them to deal with something that's so critical when you know exactly how to solve it. Um, and that's a big problem. It, it, it stunts the growth of the team um, and it makes you, you as uh, the CTO a, a bottleneck. Um, I had expected to be able to make that transition more smoothly having done it in a larger company, but in a larger company, the, the emergencies are less acute. Um, there are fewer moments where you have to ship a fix in the next 30 minutes or maybe your co company is going to die. Um, and so that, uh, that makes the transition a, a little bit harder. Um, so I would advise, advise you know, if and, if and when you face that, 
that transition to really force yourself every day and when with every problem that you're facing to start with the default of can I ask somebody else in the team to do this? Um, not just would it be nice to ask somebody else in the team to do this, but is there anything that's really completely stopping me from asking somebody else in the team to do this? Because uh, even if they're two times, three times fast, uh, slower than you are because they don't know the system as well as, as you have, they didn't build it in the first place, it's still, they will learn so much more from being trusted to solve those problems. So that, that was the first transition, I would say from like two to eight people. Um, and then the second transition is actually trusting people in the team to take that role and to step away from individually allocating tasks or asking individuals to, to pick things up and actually um, trusting team, team members to, to do that in service of larger goals. And then, but while still keeping, keeping them accountable to um, whether, the, whether they're doing that. Um, and there, the, this process actually helps a lot there because we know exactly what we're trying to do. We know what progress we're, we're making on it. And so it's easy to find, to see where there are areas that we need to improve. And, and then it's possible to dive in and provide advice to a team lead about, okay, this particular project is behind. This is why I think it's behind. This is how I advise you talk to the, the team members about that and how, how I advise you to um, help them be more effective in, in solving that. Um, there's a lot more to, that story and that transition, but you know that I hope gives you a bit of a flavor of the of the journey. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Great question. Um, yeah, open to any others. Yeah, no questions. Thank you, Joe, for giving such an insightful talk. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>